Well, hello again. This is Phil Giuliani back here on One in Messiah on Messianic Lamb Network. Always great to be here. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here and have a platform to do Messianic teaching. And this program, as I said, is called One in Messiah. And we connect passages from the Tanakh and passages in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, to give a complete picture of the plan of salvation. And in many of you have probably had this experience, but in most churches, there isn't really a lot of emphasis on the Tanakh, the Old Testament. There are so many people that really aren't uh, conversant with it, really aren't familiar with even the basis basics of it but when they start to study torah when they start to study the prophets and they see how everything foretells yeshua how everything prophesies yeshua people get very interested very excited and as i go around talking in churches and to groups and prayer groups and bible studies and so forth i find there's a lot more people that are interested in learning what we is usually called the Hebrew roots of the faith. Uh, I like to refer to it as the plan of salvation because all scripture is breathed out by the Holy Spirit. All scripture is inspired. And we know that when, um, you know, when Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, he quotes that, that all scripture is inspired, literally means breathed out. And at the time that he wrote that, of course, the New Testament was not even put together, was not even written yet for the most part. And so he was mostly, he was talking about the Tanakh. And you can go through so many examples of that, um, referring to, studying scripture so when paul tells timothy uh, tells timothy that he timothy had been studying the scripture since he was a young boy the only scripture timothy had was the tanakh when the people in berea checked everything that paul said against the scripture the only scripture they had was the tanakh and when yeshua himself quoted from scripture the only scripture that was in existence at that time was the Tanakh. And when I started one in Messiah ministry, this was the basis of it. And it's commonly, it, it belongs to a group. There's many ministries that are one new man ministries, so to speak. <clears throat> and one new man, of course, refers to Jew and Gentile. Because as I always emphasize, there's only one body of Messiah. There's not a Jewish body and a Gentile body. There's one body. And the whole church, the whole body of Messiah is the bride of Messiah, the bride of Christ. And as Paul says in Ephesians 5, the church will be presented as a pure and spotless bride. And so the one new man concept and for this ministry, I picked um, Ephesians chapter 2, 14 and 15 as kind of like the foundational scripture, which um, to kind of paraphrase, um, Yeshua within his own flesh broke down the partition between the two, making one new man. And of course, in the great Paul Wilbur song, Behold the Lord, we have the line of the thunderous praises of one new man, which is Jew and Gentile. And so that's what this is based on. And I always like to add, if you are, if you live in the Cleveland area, you can join us on Friday evenings. We meet at 709 Brook Park Road, which is Calvary Chapel of Cleveland, 709 Brook Park Road. We gather there about 6.15. We usually start about 6.30. And we do praise and worship and a teaching. And it's kind of a modified Arab Shabbat service. 
So if you're in the area, it'd be great to have you pop in and say hello. We're there every Friday night, unless it's the Friday after Thanksgiving or something else happens <laughs> that we have to cancel around here. It's sometimes it's the weather, but um, anyway, it'd be great if you could pop in. So this time of year, we're um, are finishing up Hanukkah. If you're watching this live, today is the last day of Hanukkah. This is the last night of Hanukkah tonight. And I'm sure you've been lighting menorahs and we've been lighting multiple menorahs. And my wife and I had a home group last night where we had a very nice menorah going and people really enjoyed reading scripture and talking and with the candles burning. And we know that Yeshua is the light of the world. And this is the festival of lights. And Hanukkah, of course, means dedication. And it was the rededication of the temple. And it's really a good time for us to dedicate, rededicate ourselves to Yeshua, who is the light of the world. And um, the teaching I'm going to do today is not from this, but we know in John chapter 10, uh, it mentions, I think it's around verse 25 or 26, I think it's 26, uh, John writes that it was the festival of dedication, it was a feast of the dedication, and it was winter, and Yeshua was in Solomon's portico in the temple, and the religious leaders asked him, you know, if you're the Messiah, if you're if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And he says, I've been telling you, you haven't been listening, you don't believe, because you guys aren't my sheep. See, we that are his sheep, we hear his voice and we follow him, and we don't follow the voice of a stranger. They didn't hear his voice. And um a verse or two later, he says, uh, I and the Father are one. So at the Feast of Dedication, the Festival of Lights, he points out that not only is he Messiah, but he and the Father are one, referring to the triune God, referring to the Trinity. So that happened on that particular Hanukkah, and I'm sure that um in Jesus' childhood, um, Mary and Joseph would, of course, have commemorated Hanukkah. And you've probably, I always have to explain to people, and those of you that are watching probably understand, many people think Hanukkah is one of the great feasts of Israel, one of the great feasts of the Lord. And of course it isn't. It's not one of the seven feasts. It's a festival. It's a holiday. But tonight we're going to go back to the prophet Isaiah. Um, Isaiah is my favorite major prophet. It's an amazing book. It, it, as I said last week, it's sometimes referred to as the gospel according to Isaiah because it has all the elements of the gospel within it talking about sin and judgment, talking about how Messiah is going to come, talking about what Messiah is going to do as the suffering servant. And he has to suffer because of our iniquities, because of our sin, because of our transgressions. And then it goes on to say how Gentiles are also going to come into the kingdom that salvation is not only for the Jews, it's not only for Israel. And as he said, salvation is from the Jews, but of course it's offered to, to everyone. And Isaiah's book, his scroll, if you will, his book has all the elements of the gospel within it. It's really quite amazing. And to think that it was written 700 and some years before Yeshua was even born is really remarkable. And what we're going to talk about tonight is a passage from Isaiah chapter seven. And we're going to 
go through that. We're going to expand on it with a little bit of background. It's commonly read during this time of year, Advent season, as we get ready to commemorate the birth of Messiah. And I know everybody's going, oh, because he wasn't born December 25th, and most likely he was not born December 25th. But when he was born, does it really matter? The fact that he was born and that he came to be the perfect sacrifice is what matters. But since the world celebrates his birth on December 25th, it's very difficult to, to go against that, so to speak. And um, many of my Eastern Orthodox Christian friends have just kind of given into that and celebrate on December 25th, where their Christmas nativity is celebrated on January 7th. They've just gone along with the flow. But this time of year, we get ready to commemorate that. And so the readings from Isaiah are very common this time of year to read in church because they are so prophetic and not only prophetic, but they tell us how, as we're going to see, how Messiah is going to be born, how he's going to live, and what he's going to do. And we recall that um, in Genesis 3.15, which is usually called the first proclamation of the gospel, um, the Greek is the proto-evangelion. It's the first time that the gospel is proclaimed in its fundamental sense. We're not going to get into that in detail, but we may mention it as we go along. But if you recall in Genesis 3.15 that Adam and Eve have just fallen, but they're still in the garden. So there's a, there's a promise made to them, and by extension, to us, while Adam and Eve are still in the garden, God talks to Eve and talks to the serpent and tells them that from the seed of the woman is going to come someone and he will crush the head of Satan. He will crush the head of the serpent. The serpent will strike at his heel, but he'll crush the head of the serpent. And the interesting thing there is, number one, God is going to make the plan for this to be done. Adam and Eve aren't going to make the plan. Their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren aren't going to make the plan. Some high priest in the future is not going to make the plan. He is making the plan and starts it off at that point moment. And the other interesting thing, of course, is that he talks about the seed of the woman. Now he's talking to Eve. He's talking about the seed of the woman. And the interesting thing, of course, in ancient thought is that when a baby was conceived, the seed came from the man. A woman didn't have seed. They didn't understand fertilization. In fact, fertilization wasn't understood until the 1800s, actually in the 1900s, till it was well understood. <coughs> and even the late 1900s, before every detail of it was understood. So in ancient terminology, a woman didn't have seed, yet from the seed of the woman was going to come this one who was going to crush Satan's head. And whenever that was in the dim past of thousands of years ago, the inference of that is that this one who's coming is coming from a woman and not going to have a human father to provide seed, to provide what's necessary to concept for conception. So those are the two remarkable things in Genesis 3.15. So God says, well, Eve, Adam and Eve, you guys have really messed this up. 
There's nothing you can do to fix this problem now, but I'm going to make a plan where the problem can be fixed. And here we are, however many thousands of years later, with Adam's nature, a sin nature, and the plan is still providing for us for salvation, still providing for a way for our sin to be forgiven, a way to bring us into God's kingdom, even though we're very defective. I always like to point out uh, in the book of Romans where Paul says, the good things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this? And then he adds, Jesus will. So that's, I love the book of Romans. And that that's that's kind of the, the another summary of the gospel. So as things unfolded, and I, I've been doing so many teachings from Isaiah the last few weeks, and you know, just did Isaiah nine on um, um, radio show that I do here in the Cleveland area. And if you look on the um, YouTube channel I have, which is One in Messiah Gift of Grace Ministries, One in Messiah Gift of Grace Ministries, you can find a lot of teachings, some of those and many, many others, and a podcast, which is Dr. Phil slash Gift of Grace. There's almost 900 podcasts there that you can listen to if you can deal with listening to almost 900 podcasts. <clears throat> but the plan basically starts, of course, in Torah in the first book, in Bereshit, Genesis 3.15. But Isaiah really specifies what's going on. And um, the way he does it is interesting. And tonight, we're, or this afternoon, we're going to go to um, Isaiah chapter 7. And we're going to start at verse 10. And this is about King Ahaz. We're going to say something about him in a minute to kind of give the background of Ahaz. And he was one of the kings that was a disaster, as most of the kings who were. There were only a handful that um, the scripture tells us did good things and did well. And, and you can read these and... First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, which of course are parallel books. But in Isaiah 10, I'm sorry, 7, we're going to read 10 through 14. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it, either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. So, First of all, who in the world is King Ahaz? We're going to get to him. So God speaking to Ahaz through Isaiah. God sends Isaiah to speak to King Ahaz, who's a king of Judah. So he's from the family of David. He's from the tribe of Judah. He's from the family of David, the royal line, and he's king in the kingdom of Judah. So through Isaiah, God says, Ask for a sign. Say a sign. It can be anything. From the depths or the heights, it can be something wild. It can be something unbelievable. It can be something simple. Whatever. He says, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to give you a sign. So Isaiah answers and says, therefore, the Lord himself is going to give you a sign. God himself is going to give you a sign since you don't want to say, and we're going to get into why he didn't want to say. 
And the sign is that a virgin is going to conceive and bear a son. And she's going to call his name Emmanuel. She's going to call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So somebody might say, well, wait a minute. Messiah's name wasn't Emmanuel. It was Yeshua. She named him Yeshua. She named him Jesus. She didn't name him Emmanuel. Well, the word Emmanuel, God with us, of course, is an indication that a virgin is going to give birth to a boy who is going to be God with us, who is going to be God, but he's going to be living with us. When we celebrated Sukkot and we talked about people living in community, each in their own sukkah, having a whole community of Sukkot, and everyone living in it, in temporary shelters, temporary dwellings. And we compared that to how we live. We're living in these temporary dwellings that we're going to live in for a while. And then we will be out of them for some amount of time. <clears throat> and then they'll be restored to us in a glorified state. But Messiah Yeshua came also to live in a temporary dwelling that looked like ours. Now, his was not temporary in the sense that ours is, because, of course, his glorified body was on Resurrection Day, the Feast of First Fruits. But suffice it to say, he came to live with us in a body like ours, in a temporary dwelling like ours. And John points out that the word, the logos, as John calls him, the eternal word, was became flesh and dwelt among us. The eternal God, which was from before the beginning, which has, was forever, became flesh, became a man, and lived among us. In other words, he entered into space and time. God does not live in time or space. He lives in eternity. He is the forever I am. And his name is I am, of course, because he's always in the present tense. Everything is present tense. And when uh, Peter points out in Second Peter that with the Lord, a, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. He's indicating that time doesn't matter to him in the sense that it matters to us. We live minute by minute. If you have a job or you have an appointment every 15 minutes, or you have to be somewhere for at specific things at specific times, you live your whole life based on your clock. When you go to sleep, when you get up, when you eat, when you go to work and so forth. God lives outside of that. So a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So the cross of Yeshua was two days ago. If you're looking at it from God's point of view, he doesn't see us as being 3,500 years after Abraham. He sees, sees us as being Three and a half days, three, three and a quarter days from Abraham, whatever it is. So he sees everything, sees the end from the beginning, as it says in the scriptures. So he comes into our space and time to live. So Yeshua, the God-man, actually lived in time. Knew when it was time to go to bed, knew when it was time to eat knew when he was supposed to be somewhere, knew generally what time it was. And of course, they guessed at what time it was. But he lived in time. And so, of course, he did not live in time before that. He's already lived outside of time. But now he's going to be Emmanuel, conceived in the womb of a virgin, 
just like Genesis 3.15 indicated, Isaiah says, well, this is really going to happen. Isaiah doesn't say, well, you know, this might happen. You know, God's kind of thinking this over. He might do it this way. He might decide to do it some other way. You know, what if he picks a woman to do it and she says, no, nah, I don't want to do it. Then he's going to say, oh, what am I going to do now? I got to do something different now. No, Isaiah says, here's what's going to happen. And so there's, it's certainty. There's no question about it. And of course, this is a sign that only he, meaning God, could give. No person would come up with a sign that said, a virgin is going to be with child. A virgin is going to conceive. People didn't know about, didn't know much biology. Certainly didn't understand fertilization. Certainly didn't understand the development that goes on inside the uterus as a baby grows. That Couldn't understand any of that. They weren't even sure how all that happened. But one thing they did know from the beginning, literally from Adam and Eve, was that you needed a man and a woman to have a baby be produced. A woman didn't produce a baby by herself, and a man didn't produce a baby by himself. You needed them both. Something had to happen in order for a baby to start developing. So nobody would have said, oh, I know a sign a woman, a young woman who is a virgin is going to conceive and have a son. No, it's a sign that no one else would have thought of because it's outside of all human experience. It's outside of all human experience. And this, of course, is because in all the scripture, God tells us way ahead of time what he's going to do. And it's really interesting because if you if you study other religions, all their books, none of their books, I should say, have prophecy in them. The Bible, the Judeo-Christian scriptures, the only holy book that has prophecy in it. The Quran doesn't have prophecy. Only the Bible has prophecy. So it's pretty amazing. And the reason it does is not only does God tell us ahead of time what he's going to do, he told Isaiah, I'm not going to do anything without telling you first. Not just specifically Isaiah, but meaning Isaiah and prophets like him and other people like him, people who get words of knowledge or people who operate in spiritual gifts, God says, I'm not going to do anything without telling you first. And that's because he wants to show that his promises are true and aren't going to change. If God changed his mind from time to time, we wouldn't know what to believe. He might decide, he might change his mind about salvation. He might change his mind about grace and forgiveness. So he tells ahead of time what he's going to do so that people understand his promises and then see that the promises are confirmed. So that's pretty awesome. So he tells Isaiah, I don't do anything without telling you first. So here, I'm telling you this unbelievable sign. Now, Ahaz, this is an interesting interaction. We don't have time to talk in detail about Ahaz or put up every scripture because this is not the only place Ahaz is mentioned. He's mentioned quite extensively in the book, second book of Kings. <clears throat> but he was an evil king. He was young when he came to the throne. He was a total disaster. So here he's kind of showing false piety. Oh, I wouldn't dare. I don't want to tempt the Lord. I wouldn't dare come up with a sign. But God says, you know what? You're wearying me. You've been wearying me. You've been wearying my people. You've been wearying my priests and my 
leaders, my ministers or whatever you want to call them. But now you're also worrying me. And the issue is that Ahaz didn't trust God, didn't understand anything, could have cared less about scripture and prophets. And it, um, Second Kings tells us quite a bit about him, but he was an evil king. He had always been unfaithful. He had consulted foreigners, foreign kings, made alliances with foreign kings, especially the Assyrians. <clears throat> Instead of relying on God, asking God for guidance, he made alliances with all kind of pagan Gentile kings around him, Assyria and I'm sure others that not really necessary to know all the details. And he always persisted in this disobedience. He wasn't really um, what we would call faithful. He had doubts about everything. He's from the line of David, and I'm sure he would have had, he would have many times have heard the Psalms that David wrote, the stories about David in First and Second Samuel and in the Kings, but he had doubts. It, it wasn't a part of his life. It's kind of like a lot of people you see today. They may go to church, but they don't really, they're not really faithful. They don't really have, they have, they don't really obey. They're disobedient. They have doubts about everything. They want to live their own life. They like going to church because they see their friends and they like the music. And once in a while, they, something nice happens there, but they're kind of lukewarm skimming around the top. Well, Ahaz was even worse than that. And he had followed the ways of the pagans himself, as many of the kings did, as many of the priests did. The northern kingdom, which had become totally idolatrous and then was destroyed, Ahaz started following their ways, the Assyrians, the pagan gods. He went to visit the king of Assyria and said, oh man, you know, we're you got some cool gods. We're gonna, I'm gonna have an altar built to your gods, and maybe we'll do some of that. And this included child sacrifice. You know, when you read in Torah, when you read in the prophets about don't have your children pass through the fire, this is what they're talking about. The god Moloch, child sacrifice to appease the god. It was the most horrible idolatry, kind of like what we have going on in Western society since the 70s <coughs> and even a little before. Children being sacrificed to different idols, but the same. I highly recommend that you read Jonathan Kahn's book, The Return of the Gods. It's just absolutely fascinating. And it'll explain to you about Moloch and Baal and Ishtar and this kind of dark trinity of pagan gods and how they influenced people and how they're kind of back with us today. So Ahaz even supported that sort of thing. Not only the idolatry, but child sacrifice. And he turned to pagans for advice. He turned to pagans for help rather than turning to God. So this was not something that a king of Judah was supposed to do. He gave Assyria money, gave them treasure, say, hey, man, you got to help me out. I'll give you money. He sent a message. He was still in Assyria visiting the king of Assyria. He sent a message to the high priest. Now, before we talk about the holy high priest, remember Aaron, the first high priest, made the golden calf. They didn't have halos and they didn't glow. They just wore a lot of cool stuff. <clears throat> but he sent a message to whoever the high priest was at the time, I don't recall, and I'm not sure that's really important, to build an altar like the Assyrians had to their god and to build it quick. And gave the specifications for how to do it which of course is sacrilegious 
blasphemous because, of course, God gave the instructions on how to build the altar in Torah, in the book of Exodus. Well, now he makes a mockery of that and says, I want an altar like the pagans have. And here's how you build it. Here's the dimensions. Here's what it's made out of. And you got to build it quick before I get back. Before he gets back. So he gets back to the land. He gets back to Jerusalem. And the high priest has already had this altar made. And King Ahaz offered sacrifices on it. And then took it into the temple. And he moved the altar, the temple altar, I can't remember exactly, but to the side, basically, and put this pagan altar in the front. He himself offered sacrifices on a pagan altar and then moved the altar into the temple. You can read all that in 2 Kings chapter 16. I don't want to put up every scripture because that'll be kind of tedious. But 2 Kings chapter 16, you get more details about Ahaz than you want to know. <laughs> but that just gives you the idea of how this guy thinks, you know, kind of reminds you of what Ezekiel writes when the priests were worshiping idols in the temple, when the priests were committing all kinds of blasphemous idolatry and being sacrilegious with all the 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 things in the temple and that the temple had to be destroyed <clears throat> had to be destroyed and so Ahaz is an evil king and like I say when you read through all that succession of kings I don't remember there's probably four or five that say they did good everybody else they did evil in the sight of God every almost every one of them and, of course, he was king. He was from the line of David. He is from the tribe of Judah. Goes back to Genesis chapter 49. And this, of course, you should have a working knowledge of this. When Jacob is about to die, and it's in Egypt, of course. When Jacob is about to die, he does a blessing on all the boys including Manasseh and Ephraim, but he does a blessing and tells Judah, Yehuda, that he is going to be a lion. That's why Messiah is going to, the lion of Judah, that Messiah is going to come through Judah and that Judah is going to have the scepter, the sign of royalty, the sign of governance, the sign of power is going to be with Judah. It's not going to be with any other tribe. And this, of course, if you know about First Samuel, the people want Saul to be their king. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. And God says, just give in to him and make Saul king. And his reign was a disaster. So the scepter was with Judah. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we know that God tells David through the prophet Nathan that from his very body is going to come Messiah. It's going to come the one who's going to shepherd Israel. So Messiah is going to be born from the line of David. And this is so crucial because, of course, probably the main messianic title is he's the son of David. And we're going to see in a minute that even the angel Gabriel talks to Mary <coughs> about this baby that she's going to have is going to sit on the throne of David. Messiah is going to come from David in a direct biological sense. And Ahaz, of course, was from the line of David because he was king, the royal family. And this is the stuff he was doing. Later on, to be outdone by the priests who were also doing the same sort of thing until the Babylonian exile. 
So the house of David was going to give rise, of course, to Messiah. And that wasn't going to be changed. That plan was announced. It was given to David. It goes on. The plan isn't going to be changed. It's going to go forth that Judah is going to be the governing tribe. The Messiah is going to come from the tribe of Judah. And that the Messiah is going to be physically descended from David in a very real way. That plan is not going to be altered no matter how many evil kings there are. So this is an unbelievable sign that the Lord himself gives. No one could have made up this sign. So it shows divine authority and it shows divine purity because a human father is not involved. You know, we call it the sin of Adam. We call it Adam's nature. The Bible indicates that we get that sin nature from Adam through your father, basically. Not that women are sinless, but it's the way that it's described. So he did not have a human father. So the Adam nature didn't come. So it's a sign that only God can give. No one else could have given this sign. And of course, we already talked about Emmanuel, God with us. It's amazing. John, as I said earlier, picked up on it in chapter one. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Paul in Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2 <coughs> said the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus of Nazareth. So whether you saw Yeshua in this manger, whether you saw him as a little kid walking around, whether you saw him as an adult walking around, whether you saw him suffering on the cross, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him. You saw the fullness of the Godhead. So this is a sign that no one else would think of. No one else could, quote, make up. No one else could plan it. So now we're going to get to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke, Luke, of course, is the only evangelist who has details um, of the announcement of John the Baptist to be born because Gabriel comes to Zechariah and tells him, I'm not going to get into all that, but it's a great story. Read about it in Luke chapter one. <coughs> Gabriel, same angel, goes to talk to Mary, Miriam, to tell her that she's going to be the mother of the Messiah. And again, we're not going to put up every scripture, but Please read it for your homework, and this is really a great time of year to, to read all that. And this is what's known as the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel goes to Miriam, who is from the house of David. Luke and Matthew both tell us that Joseph and Mary are both from the house of David. They're both in David's line. They're both physically descended from David. Because the genealogy has to be preserved. Everything has to be kept consistent. The promises that are made have to be realized. God's not going to change his mind and say, well, you know, Judah, these kings are a disaster, so I'm going to go to the tribe of Benjamin now to, to have Messiah come. No. No. The promises have to be preserved. So Miriam and Yosef, Mary and Joseph are both from the line of David. And Gabriel tells her she's favored above all others. No one else is going to have this unbelievable, unique situation, blessing of being the mother of the Messiah. Because no one else ever can have it. There is only one Messiah. There's only one way. 
There's only one Redeemer. There's only one God-man. He's the only begotten of the Father, the monogenes in Greek. There's no other. There's none like that. No one ever will be like that. So therefore, no other woman, past, present, or future, is ever going to be the mother of the Messiah. This was a completely unique situation. So Gabriel says, you've been chosen. You're favored among all women because of this. Now, she was a young woman. She was thought to be a teenager. You know, the people got married young then. We don't know exactly. We don't know how old she was. We know she was betrothed to Joseph, who, as I said, was also from the house of David, and that they lived in Nazareth, in Galilee. What Isaiah in chapter 9, a couple chapters later, he didn't have chapters, of course, what he refers to as the Galilee of the Gentiles, the record label that Joel Chernoff records on us, the Galilee of the Gentiles, because the, the people that lived in Galilee, along with being uneducated, kind of backwoods, simple working people were influenced by the Gentiles who lived around them. Of course, we just saw what Ahaz did, but that's a different story. So Joseph and Mary lived in the Galilee of the Gentiles. I don't know how they got there. They're from the line of David. I, I don't know why they didn't live in Judah. I don't know why they didn't live around Bethlehem, I don't know, but the fact is that they lived in Nazareth in the Galilee. So even though they're from the royal family, they're living in kind of a low estate, you might say. They're living in poverty. You know, Joseph is a, some kind of a craftsman. He's called a carpenter. The, the Greek word technon means a craftsman. So probably work with more than just wood. But they both come from a poor town, poor families. Doesn't say that Gabriel went to the mansion where Mary lived. But even though she was in this estate, she was from the line of David, and the Lord was with her in an amazingly powerful way. So the plan is consistent. And, you know, she's troubled by what the angel says pretty unusual. She couldn't understand it. And of course, nobody would understand it. Unlike Zechariah, she asks about it. Zechariah gets kind of um, snotty, and so he's struck dumb. Can't talk for the next nine months and eight days or however long. So she's confused. It's a very unusual greeting. And the angel says, this baby is going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mary would have no idea what that meant. Zero idea what that meant. Nobody, the high priest would have no idea what that meant. We can see by the Holy Spirit, and you must name him Yeshua. Why do we name him Yeshua? Because it means salvation. The baby that's going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit is going to be salvation. And this, of course, finishes up Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. The baby's going to be there without a man providing the seed. And you must name him Yeshua. The angel doesn't say, eh, you know, God sent me. You're going to have a baby. You can name him whatever you guys like. No, you have to name him Yeshua. <coughs> and... What's he going to do? He's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, forever. And he's going to rule forever. His rule's never going to end. He's going to be not only king of Israel, but he's going to be king of spiritual Israel. You know, Paul talks about not everybody who has Abraham's blood is true Israel. We Gentiles don't have Abraham's blood, but we're spiritual Israel. Not replacement theology, but the fact that Abraham is our spiritual father through Messiah. Because, of course, the third promise to Abram, Abraham was that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. 
So even all the Gentiles of the earth are blessed through Abraham to Yeshua. So the angel says he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David. This is going to be a spiritual kingdom, and it's going to be eternal. <laughs> Back again in 2 Samuel 7, chapter 7, God tells David through Nathan that David's throne is going to be set up forever. David's throne is never going to end. There have been many thrones throughout human history that no longer exist. Many. But David's throne exists because God promised it was going to live for, that it was going to last forever. And so Messiah Yeshua is sitting on the throne of David as we speak, and he's ruling the entire universe. This was all prophesied. It's all kept consistent. And it's all fulfilled. So Miriam, Mary, asked the logical question, well, how can this be? She's not doubting what Gabriel says. She's not doubting the word. She just wants further information. She wants further instruction. And so this is why Gabriel tells her the Holy Spirit is going to be involved. And so the baby is going to be God. He's going to be related to David because of Mary, his mother, but he's going to be the God-man. And young Mary takes this all in. At, I, I can't even imagine what would be going through her mind. But in verse 38, then Mary said, Behold the hands, the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. So she agrees. So she doesn't fight with Gabriel like Zechariah did. She submits to the plan, which is very different. She submits to the plan. <coughs> really pretty awesome. And so this sign that goes from the beginning goes from back, as I mentioned, from um, back to Genesis 3.15, gets fulfilled in this young woman who's living in Nazareth. This all takes place in Nazareth. If you go to Nazareth today, which is much, much different than the Nazareth where Mary and Jesus lived. Um, it's predominantly Muslim city. The um, the uh, Christian sites are on a high area that overlooks the city. You can see the precipice where uh, the people were going to throw Yeshua off when he gave his famous drash at the synagogue of Nazareth that Isaiah scripture from Isaiah 61 was being fulfilled in their hearing. They got very angry. They were going to throw them over a cliff. You can go stand on that cliff. It's really pretty cool. And all of these things that are described here <coughs> happened in this high part of the city, of the current city, because that's where the town was. It was a very small town, very backward town with very simple people, yet this was the plan. This was how Isaiah 7 was going to be fulfilled. This is how Isaiah 9 was going to be fulfilled. In particular, to us, a, son, a, a child is born and a son is given. A child is born, an actual human baby boy is born. If you were to walk by that manger that day, you would have seen a baby boy lying in the major. You'd have seen these, this man and woman standing there, sitting there looking, I don't know what. And you would have said, oh, you had a baby boy. Congratulations. Because it was, in fact, a baby boy. But a son, capital S, was given, Isaiah tells us, chapter 9. 
So again, Isaiah prophesies the two natures of Messiah. He's 100% God and 100% man in the same being, in the same person. So all these promises are kept consistent right down to the virgin conceiving and bearing a son who's going to be Emmanuel, God with us, going to be actually living in community with us, but he's actually going to be Yeshua, the word for salvation, the word for God saves, because he is actually going to bring salvation by what he's going to do. Isaiah, of course, carries this on in the subsequent chapters, culminating in chapter 52 and 53, which we'll get to maybe at Passover time. But this is the great plan that unfolds, consistent and unchanged. So while you're dealing with the world around us getting ready for Christmas with elves and Santa and all the stuff, this is what you should be thinking about because this is what the real Advent is, that the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. So, hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've gotten something out of it. And it's always awesome to be here. And um, next week, it will be almost nativity time. So, I'm not sure what we're going to do yet, but tune in. <laughs>